So imaging needs a bit of a PR makeover. Why is everyone so down on imaging at the moment? Um, the internet's awash with obituaries for imaging, and I admit I've been one of the people bidding it farewell, along with some of my fellow Mac admins. Um, it got me thinking about whether it's gone for good just yet. We all know what's been behind these cries for change. Um, DEP comes along, it's got its soft and fuzzy videos from Jamf and IBM talking about how you don't need to image machines anymore. Uh, you just hand the box straight to the user, unopened, and they can set it up themselves. It sounds fantastic. So Mac admins can spend their time on more important things like coming along to conferences. But does DEP work for every use case scenario? Um, so we're going to have a look at what is imaging and we're going to see what killed imaging and then find out why imaging just won't die. Um, imaging is the art of copying a bunch of data onto a machine in order to get it into a desired state, usually before it's given to someone so that they can use it. Um, let's go back in time and look at where imaging has come from. The main tool used in the early days of imaging was Apple Software Restore. Um, ASR began life as a field services restoration tool in Mac OS 8. Sounds funny saying Mac OS, it's the old days because it's going to be the new days soon. It still exists as a command line utility and it's the mechanism that most disk imaging tools are built on. Now, the link below um, has an awesome trip down memory lane of the process of building a Mac OS 8 master image, including the important Internet Explorer settings and cloning this disk image onto other Macs using ASR. If, you didn't, if you've never had to uh, image a machine that old, or if that was your life imaging machines that old, it's, it's a really interesting read. 10.4 Tiger Server introduced multicast to ASR, and that massively reduced the amount of time it took to image a large number of machines. You could broadcast a single stream of data containing your image, multiple computers could jump on and grab the data, but it was sometimes a black art to get it working properly. Network printers, VoIP phones, things like that could slow things down, and ensuring that the network hadn't changed since last time you imaged was always a bit of a challenge. Apple's provided us with tools that can be used for imaging, um, from basic disk copying with disk utility um, to netboot environments for restoring and installing over a network and system image utility for building images. There's a bunch of other tools that have started to pop up, um, mostly using ASR under the hood to help us copy our images off and on machines. So who can name some of these tools that we can see here? SuperDuper, that's right. Carbon Copy Cloner. Deploy Studio. Casper Imaging. Net Restore, yes. Yeah. Jurassic Park. <laughs> anyone else? Clonezilla. Yeah, Clonezilla, there we go. Does anyone have a favourite imaging tool from back in the day that is not here? Assimilate, does anyone remember Assimilate from back in the classic days? Um, there was all sorts of really interesting tools that people have, people have been using to copy. Now, members of the Mac admin community have created some fantastic tools that are the staple of many a current imaging workflow. We heard about them in the lightning talk before. Tools for either creating OS images, such as auto damage, um, or automated workflows for creating netboot images, like auto NBI or auto Casper NBI. Um, who else here avoided the process of building a Casper imaging netboot image before auto Casper NBI? It's a lot easier now that it's automated. Um, tools like Imager, NetSus, and BSD Pi are helping us to provide netboot environments without needing OS X server. Uh, we might be in an environment where we have to run it on enterprise hardware. Now let's have a look at the actual images themselves. Now, in the good old days of being a Maxis admin, you know, in the days when Apple was doomed, there was a tried and true process of getting a machine into a desired state. 
you could build one image to rule them all. Start with a clean OS, perform all of the customization and configuration that you wanted, install all of the software that was required, and then make a disk image that you could copy onto all of the subsequent machines. If anything needed to change, you'd have to start the process all over again, unless you committed the ultimate sin and modified the mask to disk image. Now, digging through someone else's master image was always a bit of fun. What were you going to find? Master images that were actually upgrades from previous versions of the OS rather than a clean install, non-standard drivers to allow images to boot on unsupported hardware. Um, might seem crazy with hindsight, but if you were the admin at the time, I'm sure there were really good reasons that you were doing these things. I can see some people smiling, perhaps they've committed some of those things themselves. This brings us to some of the challenges we faced with monolithic images. So hardware compatibility was a big one. You might need to create different images for different hardware, especially when there were forked builds of the hardware. Um, if you wanted different setups, you needed a different image for each of them. Individually serialized or node locked software couldn't be put into that image. And every change, no matter how small, needed the image to be rebuilt again. So you'd use post-install scripts to perform tasks that you couldn't include in the image. So building your image was a fairly big task that would take many days to get right. And then you could test it, find out something needed to be done differently, go right back to the start and do it again. So a new way of imaging came along and caused a schism in the Maxis admin community. Rather than building a single monolithic image, the idea was to create a workflow and break it down into smaller pieces that could be rearranged to suit different requirements and updated independently. So system image utility allowed you to build workflows that could create a master image from an operating system image and packages for all the remaining applications and configurations. But we also started to see imaging tools that allowed these components to be stored on a file server and imaged on the fly, like Casper Imaging and Deploy Studio, so you didn't need to compile for each different setup. Um, the next step was a concept that you didn't even need to copy an operating system onto the new machine, as they were delivered from Apple with a perfectly good one there already. So this resolved issues with hardware compatibility when new machines were released with fork builds. The imaging process within thin imaging assumed the machine was already in a known good state and simply installed packages, ran scripts, and copied files to get the machine into the desired state. Um, I don't know if you can see in this slide, but the main difference from the previous modular workflow is that the target drive isn't erased and there isn't an operating system being copied across what was running in the netboot environment. So we all know what came along next. The three amigos of imaging, DEP, VPP, and some kind of tool that allows users to install anything else they need, like self-service, for example. So this is fantastic. IBM is setting the enterprise IT newsfeed alight with talk of reduced total cost of ownership, huge volumes of Macs being rolled out to happy users each week. But DEP isn't always as straightforward as the presentations suggest. DEP requires a machine to be able to connect to a network at the setup assistant so it can contact Apple and be enrolled in the MDM server it's configured to be associated with. Some organizations have networks that require proxies or other settings that aren't able to be configured at the setup assistant. So the process fails before it's even had a chance to start. Sure, we can change our network to suit DEP, but that isn't always something that's under our control. DEP requires an account with Apple to be set up. The vendor that you procure through needs to be set up as a DEP agent so they can add your devices to this account. Now, any Apple reseller that works with educational business and isn't set up for DEP can't be particularly serious, but I know there are a few out there. And there are sometimes challenges with getting devices into your DEP portal in a timely and accurate manner, preferably before the device is handed to the user to be set up. There's also processes to get existing devices your organization owns into your DEP account. But there can be challenges with that, especially if they are procured through resellers that don't exist anymore. And then there's removing machines from DEP 
before they're decommissioned and sent back to the leasing company. Um, it's a challenge people are going to experience more and more now that DEP has been active for a while. So much like the issues that Mac Sis admins faced when modular Im imaging knocked monolithic imaging off its foundations, reluctance to dive into new territory can sometimes be a valid reason for not changing. We don't know how this is going to work here in, in our environment. We don't know if our outsourced deployment teams can cope with the administrative complexities. We don't know if our users will be happy setting up the machines for themselves. They're really busy and they really just want the machine dropped to them with all of the software on it. You know, these issues can be addressed with rigorous testing and planning, but that assumes that you're given the luxury of time and resources to test these new workflows, and that's not always the case. Even if you have embraced a DEP workflow, there are still situations where you might need to image machines. What do you do when a user leaves the organisation or gets a different machine allocated to them? What happens to their old machine if it's still within its usable lifespan? In iOS, this is easy. You go to settings and you choose arrays or content and settings. It's back to the start and it's good to go. But in Mac OS X, it's not that simple. The only way to get the machine back to a clean OS is to wipe the drive and put a new OS on. Now, that sounds suspiciously like imaging. So there's several options for how you can get a clean operating system back. If you want this to be decentralised and self-service, which is the way DEP is designed to work, then using an external drive isn't really the best option for this. So since Apple stopped shipping install media with computers, they've provided the ability to restore a machine over the internet. You boot to recovery and select reinstall OS X and then wait for the Mac to connect to the internet and download a fresh install of Mac OS X. So like DEP, there can be challenges with this depending on how your firewalls and proxies are configured. Now, because this can take time, especially if you have a lot of machines to restore, Apple have provided some help. That's right, if you have a caching server on your network, any restore images that have been downloaded are going to be cached, so additional requests will be handed locally. But a restored machine isn't identical to one that's brand new and out of the box. So retail machines are supplied with five Mac App Store apps already on them, and the user's prompted to adopt these to their Apple ID, unless you're using device-based VPP. So a restored machine will not have these apps present. And if this machine has had these apps redeemed on it to an Apple ID, the user's not going to be prompted to install them from the Mac App Store. So they're going to need to be sourced through a different method, uh, whether that's getting redemption codes from fulfilment or through VPP. Internet recovery also installs the version of the OS that the machine shipped from the factory with. So if you want to get your machines to be running the current version of Mac OS X, you're then going to need to perform an upgrade. Now, if the very first thing that a user is prompted to do after they've set up their machine through DEP is upgrade the OS, that's not really a good experience. Um, we've even had situations where brand new machines delivered to us from our suppliers have come with older versions of the OS on them. Only a couple of weeks ago, we got a MacBook Pro that had 10.10.2 on it. I'm guessing it's probably been sitting on a shelf somewhere, but that makes it really difficult when you're planning around software compatibility or even compatibility of the configurations that you apply to machines by default. Uh, you may not want to go that far back with um, backwards compatibility. So our firewall configuration meant that the internet restore is not an option. So we've approached restoring machines in our environment by having a self-service policy that reboots to a net restore server. The technician who runs the policy, because we don't make this one user-facing, is warned about the implications of running this policy. We give them another warning for good measure and note that OK is not the default button, and I'm looking at you, keychain assistant. Um, the machine's bless booted to our net restore server. And a couple of notes. We aren't using DEP, and we have deployment techs set up machines, but we essentially mimic DEP with scripts for our staff fleet. Our deployment techs boot new machines to recovery and curl a script down from an internal site 
That whitelists our NetBoot servers using CSR util to allow future blessed boots like this, and then it installs a quick add to enroll in Casper. All other required configuration is done automatically or via self-service. So DEP is a fantastic solution, and there's no doubt about that, but it's not the right solution for every deployment scenario. And we've struggled to get it up and running in our environment. We really like the idea and we look forward to implementing it in the future. But there's other scenarios where DEP isn't necessarily the best solution. I used to work for an independent school and every year we had to set up machines for the new year 10 students. Around 350 MacBook Airs that all contained the full Adobe Creative Cloud suite, all 25 gig of it, as well as all of the other software they required. Our handout process was that students would come and collect their machines in the last week of the holidays and take them home to prepare for the start of the school year. Now, with Australia's fantastic internet speeds, installing that amount of data from home wasn't really a good idea. And we wanted students to be able to start classes straight away on the first day with all the software ready to go. And installing everything with self-service at school wasn't going to work, easy, uh, work either. So previously, I'd used a NetBoot modular imaging workflow. Now, I could image about 75 machines a day like that, and that got pretty annoying. It was over a week to get everything ready. Then I discovered Thunderbolt target imaging, where you boot the new machine into target mode and connect it to an imaging Mac over Thunderbolt. Now, especially if you're copying SSD to SSD, the speeds are phenomenal. So I committed the mortal sin that I was so vocal of having moved away from and I compiled a monolithic image, like an animal. <laughs> Wasn't the same as the monolithic images I built years before. Um, all of the items required post-imaging were still automated policies coming down from Casper once a machine rebooted and connected to the network, but it had still had a 60 gig disk image with the majority of the software in it. Instead of being able to image 75 machines a day, I managed to get the whole 350 done in a day and a half. And most of that time was spent unpacking the boxes. There was no load on our network at all, no load on our file servers. It was all coming straight across from the MacBook Air I was imaging from. I would have loved to have moved to DEP with the students installing all of their software at home, but that'll have to wait until we have decent internet speeds here in Australia. Now I work at a large university where we run a program called Day One for the start of semester every year. That ensures that our fleet of over 1,200 student-facing Macs are ready for the start of the academic year. Now, this involves hardware replacements for machines that are out of lease, so they need to be brought up to a desired state, and the existing machines get a new can pave, because we're sticking as closely as we can to Apple's annual OS refresh. Now, we could try and leverage DEP to achieve this, with the deployment tech simply connecting the new machines to the network and powering them on. There's a couple of problems with that. Our wired network requires a proxy to be set. We can't do this at the setup assistant, so the machines can't talk to Apple. We name our machines according to the physical location in the room. Trying to automate that by getting machines into particular locations based on their serial numbers, when we're sometimes talking seven or 800 new machines a year, on that scale, it's unlikely to happen. So many of the software titles our students use also require specific versions of the OS to run. Now this all needs to be tested before the start of the year to ensure that the machines are going to be reliable in a heavily utilised teaching environment. Upgrading machines to the latest point release has the potential to cause issues, so consistency is essential. New machines, like our staff machines, we get the deployment text to boot the machine to recovery and curl down a script. That prompts them for location-specific computer name and the asset tag. Then we use Casper's API to create a placeholder record in the JSS, whitelists our NetBoot servers using CSR util, and boots to our NetBoot server. Casper Imaging then detects the correctly named placeholder record, copies down the OS, and any configuration that's required to have the machine functioning on our network. The rest's a modular workflow of policies that ensures that the correct software is installed for that lab. So existing machines simply bless booted into Casper Imaging via policy, and that's a true hands-free re-imaging process. So we don't even need to involve deployment techs in that at all. We only need to go out when we can see that something's gone wrong. 
So DEP is an amazing solution that can be of enormous benefit in organisations that are set up to use it. It's also clearly the direction that Apple would like us to head in with our deployment workflows. And I'm imagining we're going to see more features coming into future OSs that are going to make it easier to use DEP and might make it harder to use some of the other workflows. Um, I fully support this, but not everyone's fortunate enough to be in that position. So all I can say is to the people who are developing the awesome tools that we can use to image machines, whether they're open source or whether they're commercial, is keep up the good work because there's a lot of people relying on you. So how many people are currently using DEP in their environment? We've got a few people here. Um, how many people are still imaging in some form? We've got a lot of people. How many people would like to move from imaging to DEP if they could get it working? Yeah, so we've got, we've got a couple of people here. How many people haven't been able to get DEP working in their environment because of network or the administrative overload? <laughs> How many people are using DEP but are finding it's challenging because of those issues? Yeah, we've got a couple of people. So thanks for listening. Um, as I said before, I can be found on the Mac Admin Slack channel, ANZ Mac, um, also on Melbourne Apple Admins. So does anyone have any questions? I've got a better idea for how we do this. We don't ask people if they have questions. Ah. We just say, Peter, what will your question be? <laughs> Thank you. So you can't even connect to DEP uh, via Ethernet on your machines? It requires a proxy on right. Ethernet, so, yeah. Fair enough, yeah. Well, I mean, we're, we're still waiting for Apple to uh, give us a way to sign on to yeah. our network, uh, our Wi-Fi network uh, yeah. in the setup assistant, which we can do on iOS, but we can't yeah. do on Macs, of course. Yeah, but. yeah. They're, they're the same kind of challenge as we face. There are plans to move away from that. Um, like most large organisations, those plans can take time to come to fruition. Yeah. Yeah, earn your keep. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, w what are the solutions you guys are looking at? Like a, a separate small network just for DEP or...? Uh... Transparent proxy or no proxy. Right. Um, you know, DEP is not the only thing we have that's challenging with that. In a large, constantly moving environment, there are a lot of benefits to that. Um, you know, being a large, complex organisation, there are a lot of things that the hardwired proxy are actually improving, so moving away from it isn't always as easy as we thought. Who am I going to pick on next? Yeah. John Rhodes. Frank. Oh. Oh. Sorry? <laughs> no, no, no. John, John, John looked like a rabbit in car headlights. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> Um, yeah, with DEP right now, we're looking at it as well. Um, it's more trying to get the service owners to understand what it's about. Yeah. That's the biggest thing on my challenges right now is before we look at the technology, look at what it's delivering, what's the, what's the audience we're doing this for before yeah. we just go, oh, look, this looks shiny, let's go for it. To get around the network issues, what, what I'm doing, because I've got a nice relationship with the networks teams, is to set up a separate SSID that's purposely built for that reason. Yeah. So there's a business case to say, anyone who connects to this uh, wireless network is only at this stage to get past this point, and then we yeah. set down a configuration profile if we need to, to point them back to the official uni wireless that we have. So there are ways around it. It is mostly working with other teams in your organisation and trying to get them on board by giving them confidence that what you're doing is for the right reasons. And Getting the service owners on board as a f starting point makes it much easier because you go, well, there's a director that wants to talk to you about this. <laughs> yeah. And so they move much quicker at uh, getting implementation done. The, the other challenge we had, which I, I mentioned earlier, is it's not just the service owners getting on board, it's also the customers. Like in, in a large academic environment, the academics expect to be handed a machine that's already configured and has their data copied across. The idea that the first thing they're going to get is a machine that just turn it on, it'll set up itself. Um, especially when not all of our software is centrally serialised, um, you know, they might not see that as being their job to actually do that setup themselves. Now we could get the deployment text to use um, DEP to do that. That's something that we're definitely looking towards. But um, yeah, there's both sort of internal and external issues 
So what I'm looking in for that is um, basically what we do for the users right now, which we call demo, which is a yeah. operating environment, is pretty much break down everything in the self service to be you pick and choose what you want, or there's a nice big button here it can do it for you. Yeah. You can click it off and you know please come back up to 30 minutes. So what we used to do automatically for them will be something that they kick off themselves. Yeah. So it gives the impression of choice when really <laughs> it's still yeah. configured for them, but you know, they have the option. That's really cool. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're in the middle of just putting together a kind of Mac Essentials pa uh, button on our front page as well that will just have all of Office, Adobe, a couple of other things. Um, just so, yeah, we've, we've had the same thing. We, we thought that our users would absolutely love, um, like 100% of our users would love to set up the machine themselves. Turns out quite a few of them think, no, that's something for you to do, boy. Um, so, <laughs> um, but I was just wondering, do you guys have some uh, system where... Uh, or anyone else who's use, using DEP, um, where uh, a user can actually restore their data from their previous machine or transfer their data, some kind of like build, build your own migration assistant. Well, we didn't go to that level because it comes, it gets riskier as every OS that comes out is support, updating, and all the rest. We haven't got a, a core development team that can do that. Uh, we're looking at Driver to uh, pretty, pretty much fill that in. So it's the, I think, the main, one of the main competitors, the Crash Plan Pro for backups. And the good thing about their agent is that it works across literally every platform, Android, Windows, Windows, Mac. And you m migrate to a new computer, you install the agent, and when you first log in, it asks you, do you want to restore from this computer previously? And they right. can be very cool. selective about it. So being that it's cloud-based, it's also the tier that we went for is unlimited data as well, because academics don't know how to delete things. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so basically, that pretty much takes care of that whole component, because we're also moving away from internal storage, because it's getting costly, it's getting a lot of uh, latency as well, with just too, many, too much data, similar to your issues with the labs, but on a much larger scale with staff, we have research data and so forth. So. Um, we know there's snapshots in the cloud. We've got that agreement with uh, with the company. And we're just right now doing a pilot for 200 users, but we're looking to expand that up to 10,000 to make it a site license for the university. Because wow. the value is there just across the board for, for different use cases. Does anyone else have a kind of migration assistant type thing uh, built in? I this? do. Yeah? <laughs> it's from this guy called Rich Trouden. Mm. He put this script up about migrating user data doing a chone and move using Cocoa Dialog, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, the, yeah the, the, there is a script up I've seen of yours where it, I think you need an intermediary account to because you do a straight move with a home folder. I've written some stuff myself where it prompts users between one to the other. Can't share that, unfortunately, but there are, if you pay me money or lots of beer, <laughs> cool. well, well, we actually do have a uh, in our self service that only our um, service support staff can see um, is basically it's it's just rsync um, for target disk mode, um, but yeah, it's it's got all the kind of folders that we don't want to tra transfer across excluded, and it's just a really, really simple one-click button so that almost anyone can do it. Yeah, sorry, I probably misunderstood your question before. Um, we've got something similar for the deployment uh, support staff that do that sort of stuff. So they log in the administrator account, they do target this mode for the previous machine, and it pretty much goes in there. Once they've done the, the copy, straight copy for the user's folder, cleans up common things we know are, tr are troublesome. Yep. But then also the key thing is sets of permissions based, because we use Active Directory, we have to make sure that it populates through, or else there's issues when they go back to the desktop, their wallpaper doesn't load and all the rest of it. So there is some automation that we have for that sort of stuff. Cool. But yeah, we're looking at cloud for everything else. With Migration Assistant, one of the challenges we have found, we've found more and more doing straight disk copies, um, a lot of the way Apple is storing information in the user folder now doesn't really like being copied across. Migration Assistant has a lot of the smarts built in to deal with that, things like internet accounts. Um, I would recommend anyone who is a member of the developer program pay very close attention to Migration Assistant at the moment. Um, that's probably all I'd really want to say about that. But um, yeah, it's, it's very good to have a developer, um, a developer account so you can keep across things that aren't necessarily in public domain yet. Yeah. Uh, is there anyone who um, has a workflow that requires imaging um, other than DEP that they, they think could be interesting? John. Beautiful. We can wait for the next presentation for that. Yeah. Okay. Looks like that's the end of that. Thank you, Marcus. That Thank was great. You. Okay.